so we'll see applying updates operating systems are intended to be dynamic as users needs changes new hardware is introduced and more sophisticated attacks are unleashed operating systems must be updated on a regular basis i have seen places or organizations where they use windows 2003 and the last update was performed somewhere in 2004 so it is totally vulnerable system but vendors release new version of an operating system every 2 or 4 years vendors use certain terms to refer to different types of updates also now service pack it is a cumulative set of updates including fixes for problems that have not been made available through updates and it provides the broadest and most complete update so service pack is what that is it, it it is a cumulative or a collective set of updates including fixes for the problems that were identified and which were not made available through updates a hot fix does not typically address security issue In, instead it corrects a specific software problem the way a particular function within an os performs it may have a bug so a hot fix actually fixes that it is not actually a security problem but it can be any issue within the os a patch or a software update fixes a security flaw or other problems it may be released on a regular or irregular basis depending upon the vendor or the support team a good patch management system what criteria should it have it should design patches to update a group of computers it should include a reporting system it should download all the patches from the net and it should distribute patches to the other computers there are two good links of microsoft given here you can take a look now with respect to patches i have seen an application software for a particular industry where lot of bugs lot of security issues lot of coding errors so there were lots of issues in that software and the vendor kept on applying patches to that now one fine day when the audit was happening we found that there were something close to 1300 patches put on that particular system and a new version was not released after encompassing or after collecting all the patches no service pack was released now suddenly the system crashed we do know that there were 1300 patches to be fixed somewhere for insignificant issues somewhere for very significant issues now after the system crashed and it was restored some of the patches were not applied now the entire system started behaving erratically so now you understand what is or why a patch management system is required you should also document all the patches that have been applied specifying the patch was more made for this particular vulnerability or for this particular error or for this particular bug it should be noted it should be applied properly tested properly ultimately when the vendor releases a new version all these patches should be included in that version so that the organization that is going to use that software will not face problems of inconsistent software errors In another way of hardening an os is to restrict user access generally users can be assigned permission to access folders also called directories and the files contained within them windows provides a centralized method of defining security on the mmc which is microsoft management console a window utility that accepts additional components called snap ins after you apply a security temp template to the organ to organize a security setting 
you can import the settings to a group of computers group policy object now if you open your computer and type in the search gpedit.msc it will open up the group policy editor if you type mmc it will open the microsoft management console group policy settings components of the users desktop environment that a network administrator needs to manage and group policy settings cannot override a global setting for all computers it is a domain based setting Windows Store setting for a computer's hardware and software in a database, which is the registry. Just as you must harden the operating system, you must also harden the applications that run on these systems. So hot fixes, service packs, and patches are generally available for most uh, applications, although not usually with the same frequency as an operating system. You think of Microsoft Office. Microsoft Windows periodically releases patches whereas Microsoft Office does not release patches so periodically uh, mail server is used to send and receive electronic messages in a normal setting a mail server serves an organization or a set of users all email is sent through the mail server from a trusted user or received from an outsider and intended for a trusted user in a open mail relay a mail server processes the email messages not sent by or intended for a local user we spoke about this a few slides ago on how actually telnet into the mail server give certain commands like hello or ehello then received from then subject mail from received to subject data and all those then ftp server is used to store and access file through the internet typically it is used to accommodate users who want to download or upload files now ftp in today's environment is considered very insecure by most of the security practitioners alternate methods are used to transfer file that is upload and download files so ftp generally is not used nowadays unless it is a small organization and it is for a specific purpose of transferring files within a small group of people ftp servers can be said to accept anonymous logons a dns server makes the internet available to ordinary users these are all simple explanations of or definitions of different aspects DNS servers frequently update each other by transmitting all domains and IP addresses of which they are aware which is called the zone transfer again in the case of networks it's a two fold process for keeping a network secure secure the network with necessary updates firmware updates properly configure the network devices if it is a router don't keep everything open update the firmware as and when the vendor releases it if it is a firewall do the same thing firmware is update ram is volatile so interrupting the power source causes the ram to lose its entire contents rom is different from ram in two ways contents of the rom are fixed rom is non volatile so disabling the power source does not erase its contents rom Erasable, programmable, read-only memory (EEPROM) and electrically erasable, programmable, read-only memory (EEPROM) are firmware or flash devices or flash. The contents of EEPROM chips can also be erased using electrical signals applied to specific pins. Most ROM chips these days can be updated, or you would have heard the terminology flashed. In say some 15 years back. the desktops that were purchased did not have the ethernet card built into them so we had a pci card which we plug it into the motherboard and then connect the network cable now the eproms were available at that time and if we needed to connect to a novel network so we create a file to be flashed into that like auto exe dot by config dot sys and other things how it connects to the network certain configurations we put on that 
and then take it to a place where they burn the chip and put it on their network cards. This I am talking as almost 15, 20 years old. So now those were the days where we had the flexibility of configuring the EEPROMs. I think now the Sony Playstations generally the PS2, PS3, PS4 de devices they don't generally play the pirated discs or the discs which are copied. I think there are methods to flash the ROM or make that BIOS recognize these discs also. I am not advocating anything but I have seen people who have done that. To update a network device, we copy over a new version of the OS software to flash memory of the device. This can be done via a TFTP server or a compact flash reader or writer. Now this is a small example. In the router hash, you copy TFTP flash. Having the firmware updated ensures that the device is not vulnerable to bugs in the OS that can be exploited. Now, even in your home Wi-Fi routers or your home access points, you have the facility to download the firmware and upload it through your browser itself. So you don't have to know your you don't have to connect through your telnet or any other port to perform the upgrade. So it's become much more simpler. You must properly configure the network equipment to resist attacks. The primary method of resisting attacks is to filter data packets as they arrive at the perimeter of the network. In addition to making sure that the perimeter is secure, make sure the device itself is secure by using strong password and encrypted connections. Use SSH instead of Telnet and console or VTUI password. Configuring packet filtering. The UDP provides for a connectionless TCP IP transfer. TCP and UDP are based on port numbers. Socket is a combination of IP address and port number. Say if there is an IP address 198.146.118.20 and the port number is 80, the format is like this. It is separated by a colon. Rule base or access control rules. It rules a network device's users to permit or deny a packet. It is not to be confused with the ACH used in securing a file system. Rules are composed of several settings in network. Rules can be for accept, it can be deny, it can be so many other things based on the port number, based on the services. A very simple rule base is shown here. It is a sample only. Now if you see the rule number one, transport protocol is TCP. The protocol used is HTTP, outbound traffic. The source IP is given, the full submit. Source port from any port, destination IP to any, destination port is 80, action is allowed. Time is anytime, no restrictions on time. And the final says track, no, do not track. Now for inbound, the second one is for the inbound connections. Source IP is that 206.23.19.40, source port is 80, destination IP is also given there. Destination port is given that so if it originates from that the action is denied the time is any time that particular connection comes denied and you want to track that yes so in simplistic terms this is how a rule base looks like so you an organization will have several rules like this that have been configured to permit or to deny access to certain ports or services or based on IPs. So the criteria can be varied depending upon the requirements. We are almost to the end of the module. Now the summary of what we discussed now is establishing a security baseline creates a basis for information security. 
Hardening the operating system involves applying the necessary updates to the software. Securing the file system is another step in hardening the system. Applications and operating systems must be hardened by installing the latest patches and updates. Servers such as web servers, mail servers, FTP servers, DNS servers, NNTP servers, print or file servers, DHCP servers, so any kind of email servers must be hardened to prevent attackers from corrupting them or using the server to launch other attacks. This lest we remember cold boot attacks on encryption keys this is a fantastic video on how the cold boot attacks happen or how information is removed from a memory when the system is on. I would suggest that this is less than 10 minute video where an actual demonstration happens. So I would suggest that you go through this, understand the kind of methods that are coming into force nowadays as the technology increases or improves day by day, the attack also gets more sophisticated day by day. This cold boot attack will actually tell you how innovative the attackers also have got as the technology progresses. We now are at the end of module 5 and I hope that you had an enriching session. If you have any queries on the subject, please post them on the forum. We will try to answer to the best of your satisfaction. I will meet you again in module 6.